We are just two weeks away from Easter. Whew, great time of the year, right? Easter is coming. Uh, a time to think about who we can invite to join us here for the service and experience the love of Christ. So think about all your friends, family members who are non-church people. Invite them to come. We are preparing a great program here. Our uh, uh, choir is uh, pre working on cantata. There will be a road to Calvary, Easter cantata. That's April 1st. There will be only one service here at 11 o'clock, and they will uh, uh, tell us the story about forgiveness, mercy, love, and eternal life that is given to us through the life death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to share the message. So keep this in mind. That's April 1st. A uh, few things before that. Tonight, as you know, tonight, uh, uh, instead of evening service, we will have at 6.30 question and answer with uh, a senior pastor search committee. They will give you updates and they will answer uh, questions that were submitted and if you have any questions about process. So all church members are invited to come. All church members tonight at 6.30 come for the time of uh, question and answer uh, with past senior pastor search committee uh, process, and they will give you an update. Uh, next Sunday, also here, Kenley, uh, Kenley Ministerial Association is organizing several events during the Easter, and next Sunday will be a Palm Sunday community service at 7 p.m. here at our church. Uh, it will be hosted. You're invited to come to that. And also on Friday, on Good Friday, uh, uh, the volunteers will meet at Grady Park and they will carry the cross, big 15 foot cross. Maybe you probably saw one already is placed at the intersection of 222 and 301. They will make one more cross and they will carry the cross from Grady Park to Kenley Cemetery at 6 p.m. And then there will be a time of fellowship after that at 7 p.m. and uh, American Legion building. So if you would like to participate in that, Consider that April 1st on Sunday, sunrise Easter service will be at Kenley Cemetery at 7 a.m. So those are the events, and you can see all these events posted on our board. Please read and consider participating in all of these. Uh, this Sunday, Tom Lucas told me, is the last Sunday to order lilies. So if you would like to order lilies to have them here for Easter service, please contact uh, Margaret Lucas or Janice Baton. About that. Is there anything else? Um, the second ministry will be doing that this coming Saturday for Deaf and Mute Speech Media. So they said to invite the men that would like to come from our eleven who are going maybe maybe six years. They're going to have six set at eleven and they would have the six deaf and then they'll have the mute speech. Anyone? Thank you very much. All right, if not, let's come to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for the worship. O oh, gracious, all-knowing God and Father, your word says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And Father, you are the discerner of every heart. And before you, everything is laid bare. And we confess this morning the weakness that we have of our longing to magnify you and to praise you, Father. So we Acknowledge also that not everyone here has that longing. Some here are still outside of the eternal family of God, more eager that they themselves or other things be magnified than you, Lord. So, Father, we pray that in these next moments you will so speak as to awaken a longing in all of us to praise you. Father, thank you that your word says that you desire to take the hard heart out of us and put the heart of flesh. And you desire to turn hardness into tender joy. So Almighty God, may nothing in anyone's mind stop you this morning from performing this radical surgery in us. So we can be new people and that we can leave this place magnifying you with thanksgiving and joyful hearts. Because we know that you are worthy to receive all honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, we pray that you will work among us with the blessed Holy Spirit in a mighty way this morning. Amen. Amen. Please stand and let's worship the Lord with spiritual songs. Kevin. Hey, let's continue to worship and lift him up.
tell you, if you ever like me and you ever are running out of uh, things and you need to find something real quick, sometimes you'll use a tool that might not be what it's used for, like a butter knife might become a screwdriver or something like that. And I always think, man, I wonder if the screwdriver ever feels, gee, I wish you would use me for what I was meant to be used for. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or if the butter knife ever goes, phew, this is so much harder than doing what I was meant to be doing. Does that make sense? Um, whenever, whenever we come here, we are meant to be worshiping. Not whenever we're just here either, we're meant to be worshiping all the time. So I just pray that as we continue to lift our voices and our hearts and just focus on our Lord and Savior, that, uh, man, you'd be able to feel him moving among the praises of his people because he's here. He's here right now. Let's continue to lift him up. One day we'll be there in his courts with him, and better is one day in his courts than anywhere else. How lovely is this morning.
We give ourselves to the Lord, all other giving becomes easier. Amen. Amen. We will continue to worship the Lord with giving. We're going to give Him our financial gifts and we're also going to give Him our praise and our prayer requests with the care cards. We'll encourage each one of you to take those cards, write down, give Him praise and thanks for the things that He's doing in your life, and then give Him also your needs. The Bible says, cast all your anxieties upon God because He cares for us. We have a great God. Amen. Amen. Let's ask for Lord's blessing upon this part of service. Lord, for how you provide for us in, in all times, Lord, we, you know, as we go through this time of praise and worship and Lord, you tell us that the uh, to come together and, and praise together in unity and in one and, and seek you. And Lord, um, you take care of us so abundantly. And we just ask right now as we do come together during this portion of that praise and worship and as one seeking you and, and bringing back a portion of what you've given us so abundantly, Lord, that um, you would just lead us through it and guide us. Um, as we continue to seek you, Lord, we thank you this morning for the plan that you have for each of us as individuals in our lives and with our families and as a church, Lord. We, you are an amazing God where you can take so many individuals and join us together with one cause, and that's to serve Christ and to serve him to the best of our ability in every area of our lives. Lord, and we just ask that you uh, continue to do that through us, Lord. Show us your plan for us as a group, not us as individuals, but us as a group, as a church body. We praise and thank you for your love that you pour out upon us each day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that, that every single one of us, I don't know, because I don't know your thoughts, but I think that every single one of us faces little demons, you know, and, and I, it was in the news here recently about someone being thought to have a mental illness because they speak with the Lord Jesus and that they hear him speaking to them. But I think, too, demons are real. I think that, you know, if you read the Bible and you believe what the Bible says, then, then demons are real. And all of us have these little demons that attack us every day. Um, I think mine like to come out Sunday morning sometimes, like first thing in the morning as we're getting ready to go to church. <laughs> Little tiny demons jump out and say, no, you're not going to be able to get your daughter to get dressed quickly. Or, um, you know, little things like that, they pop in. Uh, but all of it is a blessing. Everything that we've got going on, the blessing to be able to tell the demons, get behind me, you know. My Lord's got this. He's bigger than any of these little things that are bothering me, and, and it's nothing in the grand scheme of things. Um, even the big things, whenever, whenever you are really under attack and going through the trials you know God's got that too and uh, you can still count it as a blessing you read in the Bible about Paul and Silas singing in the in the um, in the jail cell and, and I just I wonder what songs they were singing I kind of think they're the songs that we sing just in a different language because God has I think he likes those songs so there might have been Amazing Grace only in Aramaic or whatever Roman I don't, I don't know the background behind the language but I think it, it's interesting to think about that this song is called Counting Every Blessing, and uh, man, even, even in the big things, and it's hard to remember sometimes, but uh, whew, God is good to us. You know what I mean? God, God's good to me. So I hope you
hope this is a blessing to you. I'm going to try to do the best I can with it. I've been working on it, but I feel like this is what God's put on my heart to play. And if y'all want to say a little prayer for me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to pray real quick. Lord God, I just give you the glory and pray that this song um, is a blessing to others. And just use me however you will. Amen. I was blind, now I'm seeing in color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. I had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a and given a hope and a future. God is good to us. Amen. Amen. Okay. I just sure. That was all. So, um, I wasn't planning on doing this. I am counting every blessing. Are you really doing that today, this morning? Are we doing that this morning? I don't. That song just smacked me down. It was awesome. Lifted me up and got me at the same time. I mean. Every blessing. Are you counting it? Are you counting it? You had some clothes to put on this morning. Are you counting it? You actually even were able to get out of bed. Um, you know, you had a car to drive here. I doubt there's. I don't know if anybody. Walked. A little 
a chilly morning. Are we really counting every blessing? Are we oftentimes whining about the little things that aren't going our way or the little things that we don't have instead of being extremely happy and joy-filled for what we do have? We are amazingly blessed in this nation especially when you compare it to other nations. We're not having to dodge bullets to come and worship God. He's providing us the most easiest path that we can have to come and worship God. Don't hold back. Count those blessings and give him what we ought to be giving him. I'm failing at that. And I want to do that. And I hope you all do too. So. Amen. The Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. At this point of the service, children are dismissed to children's service. We have here Miss Kay and Mr. Ken and Miss Audria. We'll wait for you at the door. So all the children that would like to go to children's church, now is the time. We are thankful for our children workers, for their faithful work. We are thankful for our children that we have. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. Amen. Please take your sermon outline and let's open our Bibles together to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This is our last sermon in our series entitled Joyful Living as we go through the book of Philippians. And I must admit I'm a little bit sad because the book of Philippians is really my favorite book of the Bible. It's a great book. When, when it comes to the book of Philippians, I would like to use Hotel California approach just check in and never leave. It's such a great book. There are so many wonderful things that we can find there. Our mission statement for the church to know Christ and make him known comes straight from this book. And we were looking and observing this, learning how we can do this even more effectively. And Apostle Paul gives us so many wonderful advices in this book. Philippians is written to teach us how to live a life of joy. Joy is a self state of contentment, confidence, and Hope. Christians are to be people of joy. Their lives should be characterized by contentment, confidence, and hope. And Paul is teaching us through this book how to live this kind of life. And today we come to chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. Here, the word of the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. 
to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. And what we are not, please make us. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. On the screen you can see, let's see on the screen, you can see a thank you card, thank you note for a Christmas gift from uh, a six-year-old Daniel to his uncle Mike and Aunt Belle. The note says this, Dear Mike and Belle, thank you for the $50. I'm going to put $10 in the bank and save spent $40. I hope you like the cookies as much as we like the money. We loved money. Thank you again. Sincerely, Daniel. Now, when you were a kid, did your parents ever nag you to write thank you cards for your Christmas or birthday presents? Did, did you dislike doing writing them? Did you dislike the idea, oh, I need to sit down now and write down? all these gifts that I received, all the names from all these people who gave me and then write thank you card and, and send it to them? And here's the most important question. Did you learn what your mother or parents tried to teach you? you now, in today's modern world, writing thank you letters is a lost etiquette. Yes, I know, it does take time to write thoughtful thank you notes, but we must think about how much a few well-timed words can mean to someone. Now, people like to know that the things they do are noticed and appreciated. And you should give people a sincere thank you, even if it is only for something small. Now, not only will they appreciate being thanked, but you will also learn to be more appreciative of the things in your life. Amen? And that's what we just mentioned. That's what we were singing about, that, that uh, uh, Rick was touched to share this morning, and I'm sure we all know that. John F. Brooks says this, We know that God loves a cheerful giver, but we also need to stress that God loves a cheerful receiver. Cheerful receivers make giving and receiving a joy. Now, well said. Cheerful receivers make giving and receiving a joy. Are you a cheerful receiver? No, the Apostle Paul, he was a cheerful receiver. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 20 is Paul's thank you note to the Philippians for a financial gift they sent to him through their messenger Epaphroditus. And Paul is writing here, thank you note. But you know, Apostle Paul, you know how is it him? Everything that he's doing, he's writing with, he's doing with a purpose in mind. So he's writing a thank you card, but while he is writing a thank you card, as he is expressing his gratitude, he is teaching us some very important lessons about servanthood and contentment. Now let's focus first on the topic of servanthood. Jesus said that the unselfish service is God's measurement of greatness. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Jesus said. Do you have a servant spirit? Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. And the principle of servanthood is nicely summarized in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Now listen to the words of Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So Paul says we should stop allowing two strong tendencies, selfishness and conceit, to control us and instead replace them with humility. Now, how can we do that? We do this when we start regarding others as more important than ourselves. 
And to be able to do this, you need to have the conviction that giving is better than receiving. I remember when the Apostle Paul met with the elders from the Ephesians church. He gave them his farewell speech in Acts chapter 20, and he concluded his speech with these words. We read in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. He said, remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. He concludes his speech. He said, one more thing. Let me summarize everything that I said with this phrase. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is more blessed to give than to receive. A willingness to give is a primary characteristic of a servant. So Paul says, Stop allowing these true strong tendencies, selfishness and conceit to control you. Instead, replace them with humility. And we can do this when we start regarding others as more important than ourselves. And to be able to do that, you need to believe that giving is better than receiving. A willingness to give is a primary characteristic of a servant. Servant is willing to give. How should servants give? According to our passage... Servants should give generously. Servants should give generously. And the Philippian believers illustrate to us what it means to be a generous giver. Now, what is generosity? Let me give you a definition. Generosity is the willingness to use your time, talent, and treasure to benefit others and impact eternity. Generosity is the willingness to use your time, talent, and treasure to benefit others and impact eternity. Paul's driving passion was to spread the message of the gospel. In chapter 1, verse 6, he describes his ministry as confirming and defending the gospel. In verse 12, he says that he is in prison because he is defending the gospel. And then in verse 16, he says that he is looking for every opportunity to spread the message of the gospel. He says to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 5, that he gives thanks to God for every remembrance of them, always praying with joy for all of them because of their partnership with him in spreading the message of the gospel. Now, what is the message of the gospel? The message of the gospel is the message that tells us that anyone can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And John 3, 16, wonderfully summarizes the message of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Sin means to fail to keep God's standard of perfection. Whether in thought, word, or deed, we are not perfect. And because of our sin, we deserve to be separated from God forever. And that's highlighted with this word, perishing. We are perishing. We deserve to be separated from God forever. And there is nothing that we can do. But God loves us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And he knows that there is nothing that we can do to be saved from that eternal condemnation. So he sent his son. And when we recognize the insufficiency of our efforts to find salvation and depend on Christ alone and what he did for us for the forgiveness of sin, God will give us eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Paul faithfully proclaimed this good news. And the Philippian believers did everything they could to help Paul in this ministry of spreading the message of the gospel. And Paul mentions in chapter 1, verse 5, that their generosity had been constant from the very first time they heard the message of the gospel through the day that he was writing this letter. And that was a span of about 12 years. They contributed their time and talent when Paul was in the city of Philippi. And then they contributed their financial support over the years while Paul was preaching and spreading the message of the gospel in different towns and cities and places. 
And now Paul was in Rome, and church sent one of their leaders to take care of the apostle. What was Paul doing in Rome? Acts chapter 28, verse 30 states that Paul was in Rome under house arrest. Now, being under house arrest meant that he was able to receive visitors and he was able to receive and write letters. But he was also responsible to finance his imprisonment. He was responsible to pay for his own apartment in Rome. He was responsible to pay for his meals. And he was also responsible to pay for Roman soldiers that guarded him 24 hours a day. And he couldn't carry out his tent-making business. Often Paul supported himself by using his trade. He was making tents, he was selling tents, and then he was using this money to support his gospel ministry. But while he was under house arrest, he was not able to carry on his tent-making business, so he was completely dependent on support from his friends. So the financial offering the Philippian believers sent provided the means for Paul to continue to pay the rent for his apartment, to pay for his meals, to pay for the Roman soldiers, and also to facilitate opportunities to spread the gospel. And Paul says in verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you renewed your concern for me. So it's been a year, one full year, since Paul was under house arrest in Rome. And Epaphroditus came and he said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you renewed your concern for me. And in verse 18 he says, I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Philippian believers illustrate to us what it means to be a generous giver. Generosity is the willingness to use your time, talent, and treasure to benefit others and impact eternity. Now, the second truth that Paul emphasizes as he talks about servanthood is this. Following Christ as his disciple is costly and unselfish decision. Following Christ and his disciple is costly and unselfish decision. Yes, salvation is free, but discipleship has a cost. High cost to be paid. Becoming a servant who gives to others is costly. Now think about the Epaphroditus for a moment. He was the representative that was sent from the Philippian church. Now in those days when people visited prisoners... They were often prejudged as being evil as well. He risked his reputation. He comes and visits prisoner, and people automatically prejudge him as being evil, as all these other prisoners you are visiting. Now, furthermore, traveling from Philippi to, to Rome was a long and dangerous journey. It was 800 miles journey by the across the Mediterranean Sea by boat. It was a 40 days journey. 40 days journey. The Epaphroditus also did not have the benefits of the modern medicine we have for our trips today. And traveling without the benefits of modern medicine, you know, you, it's very dangerous. And that's exactly what happened in his case. While he was traveling, he contracted disease that almost took his life. As Paul says in chapter 2, verse 27. Was it worth it? And notice again how Paul ends the letter. Look at chapter 4, verse 22. Paul says, All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Now, Paul wants to know, what, what is the significance of sending special greetings from those who belong to Caesar's household? Well, Paul wants them to know that while he was waiting for his upcoming trial, he was using every opportunity to share the message of the gospel. And he was sharing the message of the gospel with Roman soldiers that guarded him. And notice, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 12, in chapter 1, verse 12, Paul tells us that those soldiers belong to an elite group known as the, as the palace guard. 
Who was the palace guard? The palace guard was an elite group of soldiers. They were living in Caesar's palace. They were stationed in Caesar's palace. And their responsibility was to guard Caesar and other high government officials. Because of Paul's house arrest, there were Christians at the highest levels of Roman government. Some of them became Christians to be witness of the Apostle Paul. They were living in Caesar's palace. And because of Paul's house arrest, there were Christians at the highest levels of Roman government. Tradition says that while Emperor Nero was out of town, his wife listened to the Christian message and trusted in Jesus as her personal savior. When Nero returned back home and discovered that his wife became a Christian, he was furious. Maybe that contributed his rash decision to behead the Apostle Paul. We don't know. But what we know is that because of Paul's house arrest, there were Christians in Caesar's household, in Caesar's palace. Paul reminds us that being a servant who gives to others is a costly commitment, but it is worth it. It is worth it. So who needs your support today? You might need to give a call to someone who's facing surgery or, or suffering through a long illness. Perhaps you know someone who would appreciate a visit. Or a family could benefit from a financial gift or, or bag of groceries or helping hand. Whether your gift is financial, emotional, or physical, your generosity will be greatly rewarded. Generosity is the willingness to use your time, talent, and treasure to benefit others and impact eternity. Become a generous giver and watch how generous giving changes people's lives. That's what Paul says. Become a generous giver and watch how generous giving changes people's lives. Hallelujah. Now Paul also reminds us that we need to thank those who care for us and bless us in various ways. Paul wants the Philippians to know that he is very thankful for their past and present support. He tells them that their financial gift helped alleviate the stress caused by his physical needs. Furthermore, the presence of Epaphroditus brought a great emotional comfort to Paul. He said, yes, your financial gift alleviated the stress that was caused by all these financial needs, physical needs that I have, and the presence of Epaphroditus in my life, being here serving as my assistant, brought a great Emotional blessing. Emotional comfort. We need to thank those who care for us and bless us in various ways. Paul tells the Philippians, I'm very grateful for your past and your present support. But, notice one more thing. As Paul expresses his thankfulness for the Philippians' generosity, he also wants to make sure that they do not misinterpret his joy. He highlights that his joy does not depend on the alleviation of his physical or emotional discomfort. So in this thank you note, in, in addition to all these great lessons about servanthood, he also gives us some great lessons about contentment. So in verses 11 to 13, Paul describes three characteristics of true contentment. Let's spend some time thinking about it. Three characteristics of true contentment. The first characteristic is this. Contentment is a learned behavior. Contentment is a learned behavior. Now, look how clearly Paul states this truth in verse 11. He said, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Contentment is not something that comes naturally to us. We are naturally discontent. We are prone to compare ourselves and our circumstances with others. We are prone to covet and complain. We don't need to learn those things. Those things come naturally to us. 
Perhaps you can identify with this poem written by Michael Lechman, present tense. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted. The colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted. The beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was now winter, but it was spring I wanted. The warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted. The freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age that I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, but I never got what I wanted. Amen, right? So contentment is a learned behavior. It's not something that comes naturally to us. We are naturally discontent. Real contentment is not natural. It is something that must be learned over time. So Paul, notice, Paul moved from discontentment to contentment, and you and I can experience this. Amen? So contentment is a learned behavior. Paul moved from discontentment to contentment. A second characteristic of true contentment is that contentment is not dependent on circumstances. Now look at verse 12. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. Paul's contentment didn't increase or decrease based on his circumstances in life. He said, I've been through both extremes, prosperity and poverty. Now, Paul knew. He knew that wealth, prosperity is not the solution to contentment. A lot of us think that prosperity, material blessing, is the solution to contentment. No, he knew that was not the case. Now, turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul gives some, some really good advice there. He's writing... First and Second Timothy is written to the Ephesian church, and there were many wealthy Christians in the Ephesian church. So Paul thought that he needs to give some advices regarding uh, prosperity, how to live when God blessed you with, with prosperity. And, and notice his words in chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, Paul says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, there are some very good, wise, and practical instructions here for us. First of all, Paul tells us that we leave this world the way we enter it. Now, we bring nothing into this world, and we will take nothing with us when we die. As Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. Now what is he saying with this? Well, his point is this, that contentment is not about having material possessions. Contentment is about living daily with satisfaction. 
It is not dependent on circumstances because it is an attitude. An attitude. He said, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. He said, contentment is not about having material possessions. It's about living daily with satisfaction. And then he also warns us here that when we focus on material prosperity, several things are likely to happen. First, Paul says that we can become more exposed to temptation. We can become more exposed to temptation. We can compromise our principles in order to get what we think will make us happy. We can allow our desires rather than our values to guide us in our decisions and in our life. So he said, if you, if you focus on material prosperity, you, can, you will be exposed to, to certain temptations. You will be exposed, you will be tempted to compromise your principles in order to get what you think will make you happy and satisfied. Second, he says, if we become wealthy, it's easy to become attached to our possessions. Now, if you go to verse 17, look at verse 17. Paul says to Timothy, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us all things to enjoy. Now, notice something. If you are enjoying, keep in mind, he's writing to the church, there are many wealthy members, that if you are enjoying Prosperity, if God bless you with prosperity, enjoy it and don't feel guilty about it. All right? It's a blessing. God bless you. That's what Paul said. He said, God gives us, he provides all things for us to enjoy. If you're enjoying prosperity, thank God for it and don't feel guilty about it. However, keep in mind that there could be several temptations, very strong temptations for all those who are enjoying material prosperity in life. The temptation for a rich person is to become a self-sufficient individual. That's the strongest temptation, to become a self-sufficient individual. You know, you can start believing that what you have portrays who you are and what you deserve. And self-sufficiency can affect your relationship with others because you can begin to believe that you don't need anyone in your life or you can become arrogant and start to look down on others. That's why Paul says in verse 17, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us all things to enjoy. So self-sufficiency can affect our relationship with others because we can begin to believe we don't need anyone in our lives or we can become arrogant and start looking down on others. But self-sufficiency also leads us away from God. When we have the means, we have a better ability to manipulate circumstances to our advantage. So we are tempted to trust in our resources rather than to trust in God. And that's what Paul says, keep, keep, focus, keep attention to that kind of temptation. You will be tempted to put trust in your resources rather than to put trust in God. So Paul says we need to learn contentment in times of prosperity. We need to learn contentment in times of prosperity. But we also need to learn contentment in times of poverty. In times of need, what is the temptation in times of need? In times of need, we are tempted to grow worried. And worry will turn your trust in the Lord into distrust. That's what worry does. Worry will turn your trust in the Lord into distrust. So during prosperity, as much as in times of poverty, we need God's help to thrive spiritually. In this fallen world, contentment cannot be explained apart from God's supernatural power. Amen? Amen? We need God's strength to help us thrive spiritually in any situation we are in. And that's the secret that Paul talks about in verse 12 and the third characteristic of real contentment. Contentment is only found in Christ. Contentment is only found 
in Christ. Verse 13, I can do all this. I can be content in all circumstances through Christ who gives me strength. Paul could be truly content in every possible circumstance because he had learned to rely completely on God. So what is genuine contentment? What is contentment? Now, Paul defines contentment as a freedom from worry and frustration about the circumstances of everyday life. That's contentment for Paul. Contentment is freedom from worry and frustration about the circumstances of everyday life. And you can live that kind of life only if you rely on the strength of God. Contentment is fueled by the strength of God. And the good news is that if you are not a content person, you can become one simply by learning to lean on Christ and rely on Christ. Contentment is anchored to our relationship with Christ. Contentment is anchored to the promises of God. And that's why after stating this, Paul moves on and he highlights the promise of God in verses 19 and 20. And this is what he says in 19 and 20. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Now, Paul affirms that our God is a generous God worthy to be praised. Now, one of the main reasons why we struggle with contentment is because we are looking for explanation for everything that happens in our life. Do you demand answers when circumstances are out of control? Are you using what you can't understand as an excuse for your lack of trust in God? See, the book of Job, the book of Job reminds us that we should not demand that God explains the details of his plan for our lives. When you face trials and dilemmas, you don't need God's explanation. What you need is the assurance of God's care for you. That's what God said to Job. You don't need explanation. You have all these questions for me. When you face trials and dilemmas, you don't need God's explanations. You need God's assurance of his care for you. And that's what he does here. Now, keep in mind, joy, joy. Joy is a settled state of contentment, confidence, and hope. If you want to experience joy on a daily basis, you must believe the promise of Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And the promise of Philippians 4, 19 contains two great truths. Number one, God has promised to supply all your needs, not all your wants. God has promised to supply all your needs, not all your wants. And second truth, God is faithful to meet your needs in his time and in his way. Do you believe that? At the end of the bloody battle during the Civil War, the following reflection was found in the pocket of a dead Confederate soldier. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of man. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. 
Amen. My friends, allow the promises of God today to lead you to worship, to lift you from your despair, to unite you in community, and to empower you for your mission. Amen. Amen. Worship band, would you please come and let's respond to the Lord as they come. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the wonder of your gracious promises to us. Lord, you don't owe us anything. You don't have to obligate yourself to us by promises. But you do because of your amazing love for us. And we praise you for it. Lord Jesus, this morning we said, we believe, help our unbelief. Help us to grow in faith so that our response will always be the response that will bring you honor and glory, the response of faith. And help us not to to have the response of unbelief that brings dishonor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand and worship the Lord and just respond. If you have anything you need to pray for with me or for elders or others, you can come here pray with us. If you want to come here and pray, just you and the Lord, share to him whatever is in your heart, whatever Lord talk to you this morning about, just obey his leading right now and, and put this word into practice for his glory and for your joy. this morning if you never put trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior do it this morning I thank you for salvation provided for me I accept Jesus death on the cross as the payment for my sin I expect the free gift of eternal life God will bless you John 1 
12 says, anyone who received Christ, to them God gave authority and power to become children of God. And then when you are children of God, remember always what the Bible says, when God did not spare his son, but gave us for him, how he will not give us anything else that we need in life. That's a wonderful promise. He promises that he will give us everything that we need in life. Our great God. Our deacons usually conclude the service, and this morning, Brother Kevin Servigny will conclude the service with prayer of thanks. Can you pray beside me? Thank you, Dora. Mm-hmm. That's all right. Sure. Um, as, the, as Dara had mentioned, we're getting together to pray for the past church committee and everything mm-hmm. for our church as we're moving forward. So if y'all bow your heads in prayer with us as we pray together. Lord, we just come to you now and we thank you so much for just the blessings of life, Lord. Um, man, mm-hmm. there's so many more blessings we can mm-hmm. think and count. But uh, yes. Lord, we also just want to ad- admit too that, Lord, in all those blessings, we are in deep need of you in every part of our life all the mm-hmm. time, Lord. And as a church, we want to come together now and pray for this need we have, Lord. We just ask you to guide the past church committee and, yes, and guide all of us in what we need to be a part of as a church together to be able mm-hmm. to support the people who are who are coming together, Lord, and searching for your will, Lord. We yes. just ask that you open all of our eyes and our minds and mm-hmm. our ears. And, Lord, give us the... ...person you have in mind to lead this church, Lord, that you would just um, make it easily apparent. And, and just, um, Lord, the things would fall into place. Lord, if there's things that we need to do ahead of time, and, and if we need to just find a place where we're, we're moving towards something else, we just pray, Lord, that um, all...